unbelievable. I feel like a rock star. All right, so I have, I, I'm Ron Harvey. I'm uh, an associate professor of psychology here at AUBG. Who here is a member of a community? Please raise your hands. Everybody here is a member of the community. Keep your hands raised, please. Who here has heard or knows what community psychology is? Ah, my students, I see a few of them here, great. I'm gonna start with a very banal, uh, but very simple and powerful truth. We're all members of a community, right? And we affect those communities, but those communities also affect us. Many people don't live in ideal communities. Maybe they live in poverty, maybe they live in oppressive systems, maybe they live in uh, systems of injustice, and it's not surprising then that some of those people would develop psychological problems, anxiety, depression, substance abuse. But if people go to get treatment, usually they'll be treated as an individual. They'll be treated only and expected to change by themselves. But that doesn't treat the larger systems that are maybe causing some of these problems. And so I'm a community psychologist, and I'm interested in how these larger systems affect health and well-being. So today, I'm going to talk to you what is community psychology, give you a little bit of background and history. I'm going to give you examples of community psychology research, and I'm going to tell you why I think uh, the future belongs to community psychology, and tell you a little bit about the future of community research. Community psychology was founded in the United States in the mid-1960s. The Civil Rights Movement, the Women's Liberation Movement, the Youth Movement, the, the protests against the war in Vietnam. The founders of community psychology were idealistic, young, clinical psychologists working in urban mental health centers. And they saw clients suffering from anxiety, depression, substance abuse, problems not very different from today. But because they were young and socially aware, they knew that these people were living in poverty, were oppressed, were living in corrupt social systems that were at least on paper constitutionally obliged to treat them as full citizens and were not. So maybe these responses were completely normal. These founders of community psychology said, we need to get to the root causes of what uh, causes these psychological problems that affect physical and psychological health and well-being. By getting to the root causes, we can do something that maybe uh, like prevent problems before they start, or we can maybe enhance health and well-being because it's much easier to prevent problems than to uh, treat problems after they've already arrived. And so community psychologists want to get to that root part of the, of the problem in order to solve it. The other thing that makes community psychology very different from other forms of psychology is we do not pretend to be disinf uh, distant scientists. We do not pretend to be objective scientists. We want to be agents of social change. We want to work in the communities that we are interested in. We want to uh, work with community members to be our collaborators. We want them to teach us about what is going on in, in their systems and what is going on in their communities. And this intuitively makes sense. Who knows more about living in an oppressive system than people living in oppressive systems? Who knows more about living with addiction than people with addictions? So community psychologists work with people and in schools uh, in an improv workshop, on a school board to be actually part of the board, or in rural Kenya working with people to set up HIV awareness programs. Those people tell us how they want the programs to work, and we work with them and help them design it with our knowledge and our expertise. There's another advantage to doing this. When people have a say in what goes on in their communities, they own it. They literally own it. They help design it. And when people design their own interventions, they buy into it much stronger, and they live long after uh, the expert or the community psychologist has, has left. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be told what to do. Most people in most places don't like to be told what to do, but working with people as collaborators solves that problem. We also work with lawyers, 
policymakers, government officials, sociologists, social workers, clinical psychologists, anybody that affects social change, even people in government, the police, anybody that has an impact on the community. Why, I've been saying change a lot. Who here has tried to change themselves? It's difficult, isn't it? I heard this quote very early in my uh, community psychology training. If you truly want to understand something, try to change it. This is from, uh, it's, I found three attributions for this quote. One is Kurt Lewin, who is an influential 20th century psychologist, possibly the godfather of community psychology. Uh, Walter Dearborn, who's a, a student of Yuri Bronfenbrenner, uh, also an influential community psychologist, and Mao Zedong. All revolutionaries. But the idea is that if you truly want to understand something, try to change it. Within yourself, you'll resist. But in, when we're studying individuals in large social systems, we really want to understand where they exist and how to change it. And the way we do that is by invoking what we call an ecological model. This is Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory. You can see at the center is the individual. You, me, anybody that we are talking about inside the community. We have our own biology, we have our own age, we have our own genders, and that is the thing that we own. Immediately outside of that, we have a microsystem. These are the people and places and things that have a direct impact on us. Those are our neighbors, our families, our schools, and so on that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. From there, we have an exosystem, which is uh, the school funding, the, the things that hover over all of these systems, whether or not things get funded or not, uh, the mass media, social and welfare services, and so on. The outer layer here is the largest layer. It's the attitudes and beliefs of the culture. It is uh, the social beliefs, the cultural context in which we live. And then there's also a chrono system. These things evolve over time, right? The way things are today is not the way they were 100 years ago. The beliefs that people have 100 years ago absolutely impact us today. The only thing I would add to this model is the planetary layer, right? We exist on a planet and we are influencing the planet as well as the planet is influencing us. And if you don't think concerns about global climate change is causing anxiety, depression, and hopelessness, that I haven't convinced you yet, but I think maybe I'm on my way. So I'll give you an example of the, the importance of context and the importance of this ecological model. I study addictions, specifically I study people coming out of treatment and reintegrating back into their community. People with drug addictions, alcohol addictions, and so on. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea of the scale of the problem, at least in the United States. This, these data are from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration uh, just a couple years ago. So in the United States in 2015, had 21.7 million people, about 8% of the adult population, had substance abuse problems. Of those, only 2.3 million, about 11%, received treatment. So almost 90% of people who need substance abuse treatment don't get it or don't use it for whatever reason. Of those 1.3 million, or 2.3 million, 1.3 million, about 57%, have been in treatment at least once prior. So what this suggests is that there's this revolving door of treatment. People go into treatment, uh, they're usually given detoxification services, and then they're released back into the community. So if you look at this diagram, again, you'll see treating the individual and then putting them back in the school neighborhood uh, doesn't change anything. Individuals, it's very difficult for individuals to resist the systems that bring them into being and that cause problems. In 1975, a group of addicts created a system called Oxford Houses. If anybody at the time asked recovering individuals what they needed to stay clean, they would usually say something like, we need an affordable, safe place to live, 
We need decent jobs so we can be self-supporting. And we need friends that are going to support us to stay clean and sober. And so this group of addicts in 1975 created this system called Oxford House. Oxford houses are literally rented houses in the United States. They're small-scale communities of 7 to 12 individuals of one gender, all men or all women. And they agree to three democratic principles. One, everybody must pay their fair share. They split the rent, the expenses, uh, and all of the chores that go on within the house. You must remain drug-free and alcohol-free. If you use, you must leave immediately. All the decisions made within the house that affect everyone in the house must be made democratically. There's no professionals living in these houses. There's no authority living in these houses. It is only people in recovery living in these houses. Uh, but they're very su successful. They have over 90%. We've done studies uh, at, the at DePaul University with my mentor, Lenny Jason. He's been studying uh, Oxford Houses for over 25 years. We've done multiple studies with Oxford House as collaborators. And we found in randomized trials uh, over two years, if you randomize people into usual care or into Oxford House, uh, after two years, 90% of people in Oxford House are sober, where about 45% of people in usual aftercare uh, have relapsed. That's unbelievable, right? And we think that it's because Oxford House people have created a community around themselves and what they say. Uh, and what they, they have a say in their communities, they have a say in what goes on inside, and nobody tells them what to do, and they have their own rules that they follow. One of the nice things about working with the community as collaborators is that they tell us what we should research. And one of the things they told us is that you should look at these social networks that evolve within an Oxford house. I, we think that will give you a clue as to why they're effective. And so we did a study of the social networks that form within Oxford houses. And we found that the, one of the strongest predictors of staying clean in an Oxford house is, wait for it, when you make a friend in an Oxford house. And when you make a friend in an Oxford house, you care for someone and they care for you. It's very unlikely in individualized treatment that that will be prescribed for something for you to do. Nobody's going to write this on a prescription pad, make a friend, and hand a treat to you for you to go out and do. But because this is a naturalistic system, this is what happens. We found this to be the greatest predictor of sobriety in an Oxford house. So I am a two-time Fulbright scholar. I did both of my Fulbrights here in Bulgaria. And my question was, do you think an Oxford house would work in Bulgaria? It's a very different cultural context, right? Uh, but we think that there's nothing very special. Friendship works the same everywhere. Living together works the same everywhere. And so I decided to test whether or not this model would work uh, for an Oxford house, also in Bulgaria. And what I found is that working in a collaborator in Bulgaria is super fun. <laughs> this is me with my collaborators in Varna uh, back in August of last year. And we opened up the very first Oxford house, in, not only in Bulgaria, but in continental Europe. This is our opening ceremony. We have the Bulgarian colors. Uh, it's a ribbon cutting ceremony in front of the house. We worked so hard to put this house together. We chose the furniture together. We assembled the furniture together. Quite frankly, I carried a lot of the furniture in there myself uh, because these guys were doing something else. But we put it together and they formed a community. And unfortunately, we had to close the house down. Uh, the house was not suitable for winter time. We had to close it down this January. And there were some other mistakes that we made along the way, but we're gonna try again. But the big thing that I learned about doing international research is this. It's the importance of context, right? Context is the water uh, that we swim in. I think I borrowed this phrase uh, from the, the late David Foster Wallace. If you ask a fish what it's like to be a fish, they'll tell you lots of things, but they won't tell you that they're wet all of the time, right? That 
Culture and context is the water that we swim in. And the thing that I learned by doing my research in Bulgaria is it taught me the, con the contextual things that make Oxford houses work in the United States. We have a system of laws, we have a culture that supports uh, recovery that doesn't exist everywhere. That made me a better community psychologist, doing international research and help, help me learn about context that I would never have learned back uh, in the United States. So why is this so important? It's important because we're becoming an increasingly globalized world. We have data coming at us from all directions. And they affect us as, as individuals. And it's very difficult to know how those things are affecting us. Community psychologists, because we have this systems approach to looking at things, can maybe help design interventions that can maybe improve the health and well-being of people in communities in many different contexts. Uh, being here in, in Bulgaria has taught me a lot of things. Uh, I have two collaborators, uh, two colleagues from Vanderbilt University, uh, Doug Perkins and Nikolai Mahalov. They've been coming to Bulgaria and spreading the seeds of community psychology since 2012. I taught a short class in community psychology at New Bulgarian University last year. But I'd like to introduce you to somebody really special. This is why the future belongs to community research. This is AUBG's community psychology class of 2017. This is the first full community psychology class ever taught in Bulgaria. These are 21 students, not everyone is pictured here, uh, 21 students from 11 different countries. They're coming up with 21 amazing, and this is where I usually get weepy, that my class, uh, my class members know, this is where I usually start to, to tear up a little bit. But they've come up with 21 amazing interventions in their home communities uh, to, to address things like foster homes, arts, uh, PTSD, uh, just um, uh, bullying, just amazing things. And they're gonna put this together and we're gonna have a, our, the final exam is their proposals. And so not only does the future belong to community research, the future belongs to international community research because the more we learn in this globalized community, the more maybe we can make a friend and understand each other. I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>